Even if you've been there for Mario's entire journey from 8-bit blob to body-snatching haberdasher to Prime Minister of Japan? Mamma mia! I hope she made lots of spaghetti! There's still a lot you may not know about the a man behind the mustache. We're plunging way deeper than the blurps, the bloopers, even the blargs, and triple jumping straight into the bonkers, the embarrassing, the unbelievable bits of canon that creator Shigeru Miyamoto probably wishes would just stay flushed. All toasters, toast toast. We're talking Mario's child army, Peach's mycological infidelity, and the 1993 film adaptation you probably haven't seen. Holy this is Cannonball. Writing a Mario game is pretty simple. It's just some variation of short, mustachioed plumber saves tall princess from dino monster hell-bent on monogamy. They then may or may not all go race go-karts, play tennis, or eat some pizza together. Mario's adventures are pretty light on the plot, allowing players to focus on the exciting gameplay, rather than the ethical implications of murdering so many turtles. The guilty party sits among us. That's why, whenever Mario warps into some other medium that attempts a plot more complicated than jump, man, things immediately go off the goddamn rails. Where's my pizza? For example, number four, the Super Mario Bros. anime. 1986's The Great Mission to Rescue Princess Peach has the distinction of being the first ever video game to movie adaptation. It's also notable for actually adapting the source material rather than just pelting audiences with Easter eggs and telling them they're very, very smart for noticing. The movie was a companion to Super Mario Bros. 2. Nope, not that one, the real one. See, Nintendo thought the original game would be too hard for Americans, so they reskinned a much easier game for chubby fingered Western gamers. Pepsi for TV game. Mario may be synonymous with casual gaming in the US, but over in Japan, there's nothing casual about him. And if the game was too much for Westerners to handle, they had no chance at comprehending the anime. The movie starts with Mario playing a vaguely Mario-ish game that makes about as much sense as a plump little man who successfully alternates between rolling around in pipes and juggling three girlfriends. The adventure is kicked off by an inexplicable glitch, which will become a running theme with these Mario adaptations. His TV shorts out and Princess Peach comes yelping out of the screen, the ring style. Bowser follows and yoinks her back into the digital realm. Mario is still all messed up about it when we see him the next morning in the bodega that he and Luigi run in the middle of the desert. The bros are trying to appraise a precious gem the princess left behind when they meet their companion. Before Yoshi, their first sidekick was apparently this horrible dog caterpillar creature who screams like a man in distress, or maybe ecstasy. <laughs> This human hentai pee leads Mario and Luigi down a pipe and into the Mushroom Kingdom, where they embark on their quest, punctuated by this extremely rad rock anthem. Adventures include Mario kissing this smoking hot toadette, Luigi experiencing a mushroom-induced freakout, and Bowser morphing into a bald ballerina. The story comes to a jostling conclusion when they rescue the princess and the screeching dog reveals himself to be Peach's royal fiance. The canine gentipede was really a human yentlepede all along. And look at Mario's face when he realizes the dog can talk. That's the face of a man flashing back through every horrible private thing he's done in front of that dog. Oh no! It's a wild ride, made even wilder by how many patently absurd things will go on to appear in later games, like defeating Bowser by spinning him by the tail, commandeering a sunken ghost ship, and even the Triforce. You must find three weapons. Three weapons? The three items that possess magical powers. See, Miyamoto developed Mario and Zelda in tandem and based them both on his childhood adventures in the woods near his house. Man, that guy had a cool childhood. But what could possibly be cooler then? Number three, Mario Ice Capades. It's Ice Capades, 50th anniversary. The Ice Capades were kind of a traveling circus for professional ice skaters. Remember, skateboarding still looked like this at the time, so adjusting for cultural inflation, this was actually pretty rad. Especially when you had tie-ins with dope franchises like Barbie, the Flintstones, and the Snorks. Similar to the anime three years earlier, the Mario Ice Capades adventure starts by way of nonsensical computer virus. In one of the earliest recorded instances of a gamer mansplaining to a disinterested woman, Nintendo. Jason Bateman, calling himself the video game prince, You've never played video games, so you play video games with the video prince. Tells Alyssa Milano the plot of Super Mario Bros. when suddenly the screen flickers. Bateman immediately understands that it's a computer virus and the bad guys from the game are about to manifest in the real world. And on ice, apparently. No! 
King Koopa, having escaped his 8-bit confines, enacts his master plan of attacking various parts of a computer via singing, dancing, and harnessing the power of mass cringing. I'm a rude. Along the way, we meet a tough, weirdly sultry version of the princess. The Koopa virus is on the loose, and you know how painful that can be. A far cry from the yelping damsel in distress in the anime. That's when our heroes enter, dangling impotently from a rope. Mario then vanquishes his enemies in his signature style by having his brother shoot them with a big gun. <laughs> It's at this point that literal carts full of children are wheeled in to collectively bludgeon King Koopa to death with various plumbing instruments. And in doing so, learn a valuable lesson. When someone's threatening to damage your computer, violence is the answer. Leo Ramini Peach pops back in to pin sh sticks to their overalls before we zip back to reality where Milano makes the dubious claim that she, quote, wins by default. Neither seems to be particularly concerned by the literal child army they just saw being instantly militarized. Okay, so it's tough to keep Mario and pals reeled in when they're slipping around on ice in front of screeching children, but things somehow get worse in print. Number two, an international tour of embarrassing comics. Because nothing makes sense, Mario's least weird cross-medium adventure comes from the Mario manga. In one adventure, Mario's old nemesis, Captain Syrup, demands he hand over a magic lamp that he very much does not have. But she spots a bulge in his crotch and is convinced that he's hiding it in the lower, center, inner pocket that overalls are famous for. She vigorously rubs the bulge as Peach looks on and, wait, is that delight? Yeah, maybe she's open to a three-player game. <laughs> Things get significantly weirder in Lily Frankie Theater, a virtual magazine for the Famicom Satellaview. In case those last two words don't make sense to you, just know that Japan's version of the NES basically had satellite internet in 1995, and they put it to good use with this bizarre little comic strip about sex, drugs, and murder nestled amongst Nintendo's otherwise family-friendly IP. A couple of animated episodes feature an NES controller being plugged right into Mario's ass. And, uh, this guy having sex with a lobster. But mostly they were weird little compromise slideshows made by taking pictures of plushies. Here we have Bill Gates explaining to Mario and Toad that Windows 95 is a hat. Oh, and here's a two-part saga where Mario escapes from a notorious Japanese prison because, as we all know, he always hides a spoon in his ass and a power drill in his nutsack. But the worst storyline, yep, worse than the lobster guy. Yes, a lobster. Shows Mario walking in on Toad, uh, sauteing his girlfriend. Incensed, Mario stomps them both to death, lights up a cigarette, and introduces their ghosts to his new girlfriend, Bowser. Another Japanese comic strip, this time from a 1994 Donkey Kong strategy guide, sees Mario team up with DK Jr. to infiltrate a group of orphans. As this weirdly specific sign states, there are no adults allowed in this particular vacant lot. But Mario's got a plan. He shaves his mustache and has DK Jr. shave his entire body, leaving nothing but this Friar Tuck bowl cut on top. I just wanna be pure. Somehow these two hairless freaks aren't the villains of the story. They show back up to find a cabal of kidnappers who look like someone managed to wrestle clothes onto a pack of humanoids from Attack on Titan. Mid-kidnap, Mario, being a useless creep, is also not the hero. Donkey Kong Sr. has to show up and fight off the kidnappers. But before DK can hurl Mario back into the nearest toilet, Mario reminds the kids that they should go find some girls to mate with. The leader of the street urchins tells them they don't know shit about f***ing, which is honestly kind of a relief. And finally, we travel to Germany for a story in Club Nintendo about skinhead Yoshis. When a multicolored pack of Yoshis meets a black Yoshi for the first time, their instinct is to forcibly scrub his skin and take turns berating him. Green says that black Yoshis eat babies. Extremely yikes! Then they ditch him, but meet instant karma when they're captured by Comic and Baby Bowser. Black Yoshi comes to their rescue by bonking, even super bonking their captors, until they decide, quote, this sucks, and flee. All prejudice is forgotten, the comic claims, even as the other Yoshis refuse to sit next to Black Yoshi. They all tell stories about how they're the victims of reverse Yoshi racism, so they totally get it. Okay, so Nintendo's dabbled in racism, sung the praises of self-medication, and radicalized an army of children. The only way this franchise could get any less family-friendly is if... Mwah. Oh no. Number one, Nintendo owns a Mario porn parody. It's very... Romantic. For anyone who saw that lobster f and said, uh, hold on, more of this please, we present to you the 1993 two-part saga, Super Horneo Bros. Do the Mario! Nintendo is already developing the Super Mario Bros movie we know and love? Trust 
the fungus. So to ensure nothing would tarnish their future masterpiece, they found themselves in the awkward position of buying this Ron Jeremy vehicle so they could uh, hold on to it for safekeeping. Like apparently every Mario story, this one begins with a nebulous technological mishap. I don't know, it looks like a computer overload or something. It's drawing too much power. Since Ron can only emote via orgasm, he experiences an excruciating, full-body electrojaculation. Oh, Horneo and Squeegee fart out of the corporeal plane and enter what appears to be the cover of a math textbook. All the sex stuff was mercifully omitted from the version that was uploaded to YouTube, but they presumably f***ing suck their way past the bondage queen and virus man before finally encountering the princess mid-tickle fight with King Pooper and some unknown foul-mouthed stooge. We're left to assume the bros saved the princess through some manner of metaphorical pipe laying, and she telepathically farts herself and Horneo back to the real world. Luigi is left behind to handle King Pooper, who re-emerges in a cloud of vaporized jism. Eventually, they all make it back, and we learn King Pooper's master plan. Collect a bathtub full of spunk, and use human prostitutes to create a swarm of Koopalings, which sounds about as sexy as it does scientifically plausible. And that's where it ends. Unless you happen to own one of the original VHS cassettes, you never get to see the thrilling climax. Given Nintendo's penchant for repurposing weird stuff from extended canon in later games, it's only a matter of time before King Pooper, the Bondage Queen, and Virus Man fart their way into the next Super Smash Bros. Best of peace, Smite, you silky slice of beefcake. Oh, back so soon. Well, while you're here, why don't you let us know in the comments if there's any deep Mario lore we missed. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you like and subscribe. And if you didn't enjoy it, simply raise your hand and a server will be right over. Any minute. You've got really keep it up there.